the stillness of this moment, Jesus, I know that you are here. Forgive me when I'm not focused. Let your presence draw me. Jesus, you are here, and I praise you for who you are. Jesus, overflow in me, I want to love you with all my heart. Jesus, you are here, here with me. before your altar, Jesus, you are making all things clear. As you remind me all you've done for me, how could I
Hey, good morning, everybody. What a great new song. We haven't played that one at Central Community Church. That's the first time here. So welcome. Welcome and good morning to Central Community Church of God's online worship service here this Sunday, July the 2nd, 2023. My name is Malcolm Bullock, and I'm honored and blessed to be called pastor of this church family here in Hanford, California. Man, oh man. You know, the Bible tells us in Psalm 100, you know, it's, a, it's a psalm of, of thanksgiving. And it says, it says this, Shout with joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him, singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving. Go into His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and, and praise His name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever, and His faithfulness continues to each generation. You know, when we read Scripture like that, one does not even have to guess what kind of attitude we need to have as we enter into the house of the Lord or as we gather together to worship Jesus. Too often, people enter a service with the idea that it's up to those that are ministering in music to somehow, quote, get us in the mood to worship, right? And if only that happens, well, then we'll worship. If they get us feeling like we should start singing, well, then we'll sing. If they get us that we should start praying, well, then we pray. Well, according to Scripture, praise and worship is something that we should bring with us to the church. And, and, and the music simply expands upon or enhances what we already are sensing in our spirit. That's how we should come to church. So we want to encourage you today to actively appreciate and worship the Lord together. Let's pray. Father God, you alone are worthy of all the glory and thanksgiving. And Lord, your overwhelming joy never fails to make all the earth just sing for your glory. You are blessed, Lord, never lacking in anything. We pray before you today to, to ask for guidance and strength to start this celebration. And we humbly pray that you would grant us your, your blessing to, to make this a success. The treasures of the whole earth are nothing compared to your grace. Dear God, with your power, nothing is impossible. With spirits raised and hearts trusting, we are grateful for your promise that when two or more are gathered, you are there amongst us. We thank you for the opportunity to gather in your holy presence once more. And Lord, we've asked that you bless our worship service today. In the mightiness of Jesus' name, we offer these prayers. Amen.
He's lifted high. He's on the throne forever. All the praise to you alone, Lord. So let my soul magnify the Lord. Christ be lifted higher. Christ be lifted higher. There's no one greater and nothing I want more than Christ be lifted higher. Christ be lifted high. Let my soul, let my soul. talk about something called the gospel in a nutshell. Let me read these verses to you. This sort of describes what a gospel in a nutshell is. John 3, verses 16 and 17. You know these verses. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. You know, in World War II, there's a thing called the Siege of Leningrad. Now, city called St. Petersburg, and it was one of the longest and deadliest sieges in recorded history. And during World War II, Nazi forces held this city hostage for over two years, severely disrupting supply lines for the city. And this resulted in the city a terrible famine. Over 800,000 civilians died. People who survived the siege no longer took their daily bread for granted. Even years later, they would feel anxious about food shortages, and sometimes they would resort to hoarding. They would get really upset also when, when they saw food that was wasted with or just played with. See, today we're focusing on what is probably the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3.16. Like I said earlier, this is what has been called the, the gospel in a nutshell, because really it summarizes all that God has done for us. But in some parts of the world, this verse is, has become so familiar that its profound meaning is sometimes just overlooked and overlooked and taken for granted. To people who are aware of their need for God, this text is as, is as valuable as a loaf of bread to a victim in a famine. Propelled by his love for humanity, God the Father sent his one and only Son to save us. Save us. Now those who believe in him are saved from death and destruction. For they shall not perish. But let us treasure this truth every moment of our lives. Let's pray. Almighty Lord, thank you for the empty tomb and Jesus' victory over the grave. And just as Jesus' death pardoned my sin, 
His resurrection assures my future and our future. Lord, thank you for grace. Thank you for glory. May our lives today be lived by the power of the resurrection. Lord, how can we ever thank you enough? You endured more pain, more shame, more sorrow, more grief than we can possibly fathom. And help us remember why you gave your life. Because of love. And because of mercy. Because we desperately need them both. Knowing Jesus puts our hearts at peace. Lord, help us to live a life of thanksgiving for your salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You came for the weary and the broken. You came for a sinner just like me. So here I am, surrendered, arms wide open, longing for your presence desperately. Awake, awake the soul in me. Holy Spirit, light a fire inside of me. Come and breathe new life to these dry bones. Resurrect this heart of stone, oh Lord. Awake the soul. Wake the soul in me. You said you'd never leave me or forsake me. You said you'd never leave the one behind. So here I am, leaning on your promise. Every word you've spoken right on time Every word you've spoken come alive Awake, awake the soul in me Holy Spirit, light a fire inside of me Come and breathe
Folks, today we begin what I think is one of the greatest passages uh, of the New Testament. And it's found in 2 Corinthians, beginning in chapter 2. Here is the clearest explanation in all the Word of God of the secret of the Apostle Paul's absolutely phenomenal ministry. It runs from chapter 2, verse 12, through chapters 3 and 4, 5, 6, and ends with, with verse 2 of chapter 7. Now, I read a book years ago called Authentic Christianity. I'm using a lot of the basis for that for, for our series. But because it meant so much in my own life, and I've seen its impact in the lives of many others, it's such a, such a great, wonderful, splendid example of what genuine, true, authentic, authentic Christianity is. And yet, strangely enough, this great passage is a parenthesis in the Second Corinthians epistle. It is a digression on, on Paul's part. Paul has been speaking to the Corinthians about his pressures, about his problems, and the problems that are happening in Corinth. He was waiting in Macedonia for Titus to return with news of what was happening in the church at Corinth. He was feeling a great disturbance of mind, as we will see in a moment, and out of that there grew this magnificent description of the power by which he labored and lived. It comes almost as a spontaneous outburst from the Apostle's heart to counteract the sense of failure and despair which he was feeling in his ministry at the time. We get this background in verses 12 and 13 of chapter 2. He says, When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, a door was opened for me in the Lord. But my mind could not rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. Now those brief words right there gather up a tremendous experience in Paul's life. He had gone to Troas from Ephesus, as he tells us here, to preach what? The gospel of Christ. This was his great joy everywhere, to preach the gospel of Jesus. Wherever he went, he knew he would find people that are sunk in despair, that were filled with darkness. Their lives were governed by superstition and fear, being hounded and haunted and hurt by all that they were going through. People who, without realizing what they were doing, had fallen into terrible, hurtful things that were absolutely destroying them. And it was Paul's great joy. It really was. It was Paul's great joy to come with the good news of Jesus Christ. The one who understood the hurts of men, the deliverer, the healers of hurts, the one who had the power to touch human lives and absolutely transform them. Paul longed to preach the gospel, as he tells us, in all the earth if he could because it was such a tremendous thing to see the power of God let loose among, among people to set them free. So he came into the city of Troas for that purpose, and as he tells us here, a great door was opened for him by the Lord. That is, there was a responsiveness to his message, is what he's saying, and a great opportunity to get out, to get it out. Hundreds, even thousands of people, perhaps, gathered in the marketplaces or wherever they could to hear the word of Paul, the Apostle Paul. But 
the church was already there. And the city was stirred as Paul came and had this great opportunity to preach to them. And yet, as he tells us here, he was unable to take advantage of it. His heart was so troubled, his spirit was so anxious for news of what was happening in Corinth, that he just could not minister to these people. He was restless of spirit and troubled of heart, and he had to leave. I know and I recognize this feeling. I think he could see as he was waiting there in those weeks and months that perhaps all his labors in Corinth were about to just fall apart. He must have been gripped by the sense, great sense of, of a personal failure that in the visits he had made to Corinth, in the letters that he had written to them, there was no way seemingly to work out this terrible problem that was eating at the life of this church and threatening to destroy all the work he had done. And in the midst and sense of that failure and pressure and anxiety, he was given this great opportunity now. But he couldn't lay hold of it. He left Troas and he went up to Macedonia instead, hoping to find Titus there and find some relief for his troubled mind. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever felt that way or not, but I know, like I said before, I have just recently. I know what it means to be called on to preach and teach the Word of God at times when my heart was so filled with, with anxiety and distress that I did not know whether I could open my mouth or not. I just didn't feel it. Things were distracting me, pulling me away. So I understand what Paul felt. And I feel many of, many of you do as well. As he so honestly shares with us, this with us. And yet the next verse is so astounding. Verse 14. He says, but thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumph and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. This is one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. This is what helps me in ministry. What an outstanding cry of grateful thanksgiving for a powerful and effective ministry. And it stands right next to the verse in which he's confessing his failure and his weakness, his frustration, and his despair. And it's kind of amazing, isn't it? Verses 14 through 16, they give us this cry of grateful thanksgiving from, from the apostle's heart. Verse 17 is a description from his own lips of, of a significant and effective ministry. And yet they stand side by side with his, admission, with his admission of his failure. So why this sudden flip-flop? Why this sudden reversal? Humanly speaking, the apostle's circumstances were dreary and dark and certainly without encouragement. But spiritually, he says, spiritually, he says, on the basis of an understanding to which he had come to of how God works, he knew that the circumstances were actually bright and glowing with great possibilities. So then he was rejoicing. He calls it always led in triumph in Christ. Did you see that? Always led in triumph in Christ. And I think the Bible scholars are right when they say that Paul is thinking here, quite evidently, about those Roman triumphs. See, was, you got to remember now, it's a custom at this time in the Roman Empire when a conquering general returned from a campaign over, over one of the enemies of Rome. And if he had fought a hard campaign and thoroughly overcome the enemy, subduing that threat to Rome, that the Senate would meet and they would grant this general a triumph, what they call a triumph. Now, this would be the equivalent to what we would call a ticker tape parade in New York City that they give to honor a triumphant person when they're showered with ticker tape and acc acclamation. In, Roman, in the Roman triumphs, the conquering general would ride through the streets of Rome in his chariot preceded by numbers of priests, great numbers of priests, swinging these pots of, of fragrant incense. Okay? Behind it would come the captives that he had taken, being led to their execution in chains. Then there would come the generals of his army, the captives and commanders of his forces. His whole armies would march in, and the streets would be filled, filled with people just, sh just shouting acclamation to him. Now that's what Paul says was going on at the same time that he was feeling depressed, lonely, and frustrated, and discouraged in Macedonia. Isn't it amazing that he would put those two things together in that sort of a juxtaposition? He further describes it as marked by a spreading forth of the fragrance of Christ. The beautiful character of Jesus was becoming evident through this pressure on him. 
Verses 15 and 16 go on to say, For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? See, in the Roman triumph, to the prisoners, to the prisoners in chains following the conquering general's chariot, the fragrance of the incense was to them, and it was an order of death. They're about to die. But to those who were part of the army and to the citizens of Rome who had been spared the threat to the city, that fragrance was a life. It was a, sorry, a fragrance unto life. And Paul applies that to himself. He says, that, he says that as he goes about preaching this good news of Jesus Christ, the fact that Jesus is alive and could free men and women and deliver them from their inner torments and pressures, that this was everywhere a fragrance to God of the life of his son. Wherever Paul went, God could smell the sweetness and beauty of Jesus in what Paul was doing. But more than that, folks, more than that, it was a fragrance of Christ to people, a fragrance of Christ to humanity. A pastor friend was telling me just this last week of, of a funeral service he conducted a few weeks ago of a man who had received the Lord not long before, just before his death, his accidental death. Now, there was one small group there which was very upset at the funeral by what my pastor friend said at the funeral about freedom and the new life in Christ. They were there, and they were sullen and angry, and they wrote him letters about it afterward. To them, that service was a fragrance of death unto death, and they didn't like it. But others that were there were rejoicing in the hope and the freedom that Christ had given this man as accepting Jesus before his death despite having a very hurtful life previously. To them, this message was a fragrance of life unto life. See, at that point, we're always dealing with, with blank, stark reality, aren't we? And this is, this is what Paul's talking about. Wherever he went, he said, people were either, were either helped on to freedom and life in Christ, or they were angry. Their opposition hardened. And they were driven further unto death. But the thing is, nobody took him for granted. Paul made an impact wherever he went. Paul describes his own ministry in those terms. So what does this all mean? Well, I think it means that the world was unimpressed by the Apostle Paul. They were unimpressed by him. This was a bandy-legged, bald-headed, hook-nosed little Jew traveling around the Roman Empire, preaching, however, this great message. He was never received in each town by the Chamber of Commerce, folks. He was not. No reporters followed him around giving verbatim reports of everything that he said word for word. Even in his own eyes, in Paul's own eyes, he was not doing anything that tremendous. He himself was feeling, as he says, frustrated and restless. A great sense of failure gripped him. But what he says was actually happening, despite this, was that he knew that, that because his ministry did not rest upon his feeble efforts to do something for God, but on his expectation that God was going to do something through him, that he was at the very moment of his frustration, he was being led in triumph by Jesus Christ. Man, a great widespread testimony of the fragrance of Jesus Christ through Paul was going out. People were being set free, and his ministry was a success. And so he cries from this eternal gratitude of his heart, thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumph. Hallelujah. You see? Hallelujah. I want you to know that if I did not believe in that great principle myself, I would resign from the pastorate tomorrow morning. I'm done. Let me tell you something. A friend told me after spending, he was spending a week on the campus of a Northwestern, Pacific Northwest uh, University. Christian University. He had meetings in the evening, and in the morning it was his responsibility to have the chapel hours in the morning. Now for four days he had the privilege of teaching the Word of God to about 2,400 college students who sat there very quiet, very, very quiet, I should say, and responsive, listening to everything he was saying. And it was a tremendous opportunity, but I, I, wanted, I want you to know that every morning that he spoke from a very heavy heart, this pastor. He could bear witness, as Paul does in Romans 9, that 
He was speaking the truth in Christ. Uh, he says, I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. And the reason was, be was because his second daughter, who had for eight years been struggling with her faith, is now wandering farther and farther away from it. And despite the family's daily prayers, rather than drawing closer, she seemed to be going further into this hurt, into hurtful things so that her family was being terribly hurt. See, you can't face something like that without being aware, as a parent, that you may have contributed a great deal to the reasons for what was happening. See, the, the enemy is very quick to assault you, to accuse you. This is your fault. So he's ministering all last week with a very heavy heart out of a deep and personal anguish this man was. The only thing that enabled him to keep going to these students was, was that he has confidence in what Paul is saying here in that despite the personal frustration and darkness that he was going through, he was also being led in triumph by Jesus Christ. And out of his personal weakness would come a great manifestation of the strength of our Lord and the spreading of that fragrance of Christ. This is what is properly called the victorious Christian life. You hear a lot about that today, don't you? And much of it is unbiblical in my judgment. It's unbiblical. There are strange, there are strange ideas out there of what the victorious life, life even uh, consists of. Some people see it as a kind of Disneyland. Many of you had that experience, I'm sure, of going through the Pirates of the Caribbean and Disneyland or Disney World. When you get aboard a boat and you go through that tunnel, immediately you're assaulted by enemies. Strange figures leap out out of the darkness at you, brandishing huge knives and swords. Pistols are discharged right in your face. Cannons fire and cannonballs splash on either side of you. And it looks like your life is in horrible danger. But you sit there in that boat quietly unmoved because you know that you're going to be led safely through all of this and nothing is ever going to get you. See, there are a lot of people that have that view of the Christian life. They think because they are Christians, because they happen to now be a child of God, a son of the king or a daughter of the king, they're going to be protected and kept from every single pressure and danger of life and nothing is ever going to get them. And they quote many verses to support that view. Well, if that is the view of the victorious life, then I want you to know that, that Paul did not know anything about that because he went through terrible testings and a great times of pressure. He will describe them for us in this very letter of 2 Corinthians. They are unbelievable in their intensity and in their power to just rack and ruin in his, brought rack and ruin in his life. Yet he could cry out through it all in great confidence and a triumphant spirit that rings throughout this whole passage. Because he knew according to the great principle which he had learned through much pain and anguish that God was carrying out his purposes through the very weaknesses that he was going through. Man, some people see the victorious life as a kind of constant, visible demonstration of tremendous power that no obstacle can stand in their way. I am a Christian. Get out of my way. They see it much like General Patton slashing his way across countries of Europe in the World War II, smashing all obstacles in his path, visibly triumphant all the way into Germany. They expect that. They expect to feel powerful and to see the power of God let loose in such triumphant ways that all obstacles are visibly crushed. But again, if that is what it is, Paul did not know anything about it. He didn't see that. If we can judge from his life, instead, the victorious Christian life is a feeling of weakness with only brief glimpses of success. Seemingly going from one battle to another, from one conflict to another, without ceasing. With little sense of personal triumph at the moment. And yet, folks, and yet that triumph is happening. And that is what Paul is singing about here. His life was making a powerful impact on these communities. And it's clearly evident to us who live in this 21st century that apart from the Lord himself, 
Probably no other human being has ever made such a fantastic impression on human history as the Apostle Paul. Great cities in this world today are named for him. The capital of Minnesota, St. Paul, Minnesota, Sao Paulo, Brazil. These are testimonies to the effect this man has had upon the world even 20 centuries later. And why? Well, he tells us. It's because he learned a secret that many Christians seemingly forget today. But, is it, but it is the secret of the impact of, his, of this mighty life. Listen to how he describes his ministry in his brief summary in verse 17. For we are not, like so many, peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. And notice the contrast there. I'll leave that above my head. Notice the contrast there. We are not like a lot of people, he's saying, who in this first century are going around finding attractive little trinkets in the Word of God and peddling like street salesmen and hawkers and making a good living over people's curiosity about some of the subject that the Word of God treats. See, they were doing that in that day, and they're doing it today in the 21st century. They're still doing it. The world today is full of religious racketeers, con artists, who are doing exactly what Paul called here, peddling God's Word selling it for profit. Turn on the television, pick up a magazine, listen to the radio, especially check out YouTube or Google or Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or any other social media, and you hear them everywhere on every side of the, of the story. They peddle tongues or healing or prophecy or whatever it might be. Not that these things don't have validity in themselves, they do. But these racketeers take that which is peripheral and secondary, and they make it the core, the central. Everything gathers about it, and that's all they write about, and that's all they ever talk about, and all they think about. Prophecy, 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 prophecy. It's not just about that, it's peripheral. They're hawking it as a salesman, and would, as a salesman with any product in the econ economic world today. And Paul says, no, we are not like that. There's another form of it today which I think was also prevalent in his day. Certain people pose as, as biblical scholars. They write, their learned, they write learned discussions about various aspects and passages of Scripture, and they command high salaries for dispensing their theological, I'm telling you, theological junk to people that will watch it or come and see it. It's going all over the world, and it's certainly going on right here in California. I don't mean to brand any legitimate faculty of Christian theological, no university learning by that description at all, but when given the opportunity, I simply take the opportunity to remind those places that as brothers and sisters in Christ, of the hunger we found in the student body for closeness of relationship and adult leaders of, that, of any particular faculty, we have to remind them. I prefer to remind them of the responsibility that they have to those students to minister as shepherds to these young people, these young minds who are spending four years on this campus, a responsibility that some, at least, among them have already shoved aside or are easily forgetting. And I have at times spoke to them, paraphrasing with great impact, a passage from Luke 17, where Jesus said, in effect, look, if you're going to mess with God's children, you had better consider the possibility of committing suicide first. And that sobered these people as it ought to sober all of us. Paul has nothing to do with this kind of superficial, shallow approach to the Word of God. His ministry, as he describes it, is fourfold, okay? He is first, sincere, that is, he practices what he preaches. He believes what he is saying. He does not preach, he does not preach cream and then serve skim milk. He's doing what he declares. And second, his ministry is purposeful. This is so important. We are commissioned by God, he says. We are not just sent into this world to enjoy ourselves and try to get through it and retire in a comfortable way. No, we have a goal to accomplish. We have been sent to do something. Colossians, in fact, tells us what it is. Him we proclaim, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man mature in Christ. For this I toil, striving with all energy, which he mightily inspires with me. This is what we are sent to do as Christians in Christ. That is my goal, and may I never forget it. And that's your goal too. That ought to be the goal of every Christian. That we help one another grow up and become mature individuals, emotionally, spiritually. 
And in every way to forget our childish little ways to turn away from that and just grow up and be men and women in Christ. And finally, he did so, he says, in Christ. He says, we speak in Christ. In verse 17, we speak in Christ. Later on, he calls himself, in 2 Corinthians 5.20, he says, he calls himself ambassador for Christ, God making his appeal through us, we beseech you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He calls himself an ambassador for Christ. He spoke with authority because he came as a representative of God to deliver a message that the world desperately needed to hear, an ambassador for Christ. You know, it's, it's hopeless to look to, a sec, to secular leadership, folks, to, to get out of this mess that we're in today. If the church is not going to say to the world what God has sent, to, sent, sent it to say, there's no hope for this country or any other country today. Because the church, the word of God, is the truth that we need. It is light in our darkness we need. That's what every one of us has been commissioned by God to declare the light in the midst of this darkness. Every one of us, we are the light. That is what Paul's talking about. Not, to, not, not out to make a quick, soft living, making in millions of dollars by hawking some attractive trinket in, in the Word of God, but proclaiming the truth of God so that people are truly delivered, truly delivered and set free. What a, what a ministry that was. No wonder in the midst of it, he raises this question at the end of verse 16, who is sufficient for these things? When you think of what we're sent to do, I'm sure that's a question that really grips your heart. Because it does mine. Paul's going to answer that question in the third chapter, and it would not hurt if you go ahead and read ahead for next week to find out what the answer is. We'll come to it next week. But he raises the question because it's so obvious that no human resource is capable of this. Who can do this? Who can school? Who can, what school can you graduate from that will give you this capability? What course can you take? What human leader can you follow that will teach you how to function in these, in these realms and on these terms so that people are actually set free? Who is sufficient for these things? Jesus himself raised the question with his disciples. On one occasion, he turned to the twelve and said to them, You do not know what you asked. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptized baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? In their ignorant futility, they said, yeah, sure, we can do it. We're able. Just as many of us have unthinkingly said, yeah, we can do it. See, but Jesus' words are very solemn. In verse 23a, he says, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with baptism that I'm baptized with. He meant by that that there would be frustration. There would be fear. There would be loneliness and death in your experience if you're going to see the power of God released in your life. It's not going to be a bowl of roses. The victorious Christian life is not one of continual victory in the sense of overcoming all obstacles and feeling triumphant all the way as you go. No, no. It's one of anguish, of heart at times, of deep inner doubts, of fighting with frustrations without and fears within. It is one of being opposed oftentimes and yet confident that the God who is, who is within you is able to work His work and do his will. That out, of, that out of the fear, the frustration, and the failures, coming triumph and victory and the fragrance of Jesus Christ. Have you come to that? That's what's going to turn and change the world around us. Have you come to that? That out of the fear and the frustration and the failure, there is triumph coming, folks. There is victory coming, and the fragrance of Jesus will overwhelm it all. I pray that you do come to that. That will change the world. God grant that we will understand this as we go farther through this passage together. Pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you for this compelling word from the lips of this great apostle. Lord, we thank you that through the centuries, and though the centuries have rolled away since those days, you have not changed, nor has the world changed, nor have we that your power is as manifest and as powerful today as ever. And you can handle this age as well as you did any age or any place or time. We thank you for the privilege of being called into a ministry like this that does not rest upon our resources, our personalities, our money, our time, or anything else but the greatness of you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we may be your instruments in this day and pray that we might understand this anew and afresh. In this we pray in the name of Jesus our Lord.
Amen. Welcome back. Before we close uh, uh, in prayer and in intercessory prayer, I want to let you all know, as I always do each week, of our Zoom fellowship night on Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. Uh, the room number, we're right above my head there in that little picture, Zoom. Download the Zoom app. It's free. Okay, it's free on your phone, your tablet, uh, computer, whatever. Download that if you've got a camera. Put the camera on. And uh, you, you put in that waiting room, and I'll let you in in about five to ten seconds. You'll be allowed. You're permitted. Bring your Bibles with you, bring your questions with you, bring your prayer requests with you, bring your praises with you. Get ready to have a conversation with some great, wonderful, friendly people. It's really low-key. It's nothing, no, there's no pressure. There's no wrong questions. We're there to help each other through the Word of God. Okay, we're there to help each other. You can also help me, too. I don't know, I don't have all the answers. Let's work, let's, let's work through it together. Let's work through it together. And I pray you come and join us on that Thursday night. 6.30 p.m. Pacific time, for those who are watching up anywhere else outside of Pacific Standard Time. 6.30 p.m. Pacific time, and we go from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Bring your prayers. We pray for you. At the end, we pray for each other. Bring your prayer requests. We, have a, we just pray for each other. And uh, But we start off with this wonderful, friendly conversation. Let us know how you're doing, where you're, call, where you're, where you're chatting to us from. So come and join us. Come and join us. The other thing is, uh, the church, uh, we start Sunday mornings here in Hanford, California, 10 a.m. every Sunday morning at 1100 North Reddington Street. We've got a big gold church here. It holds 300, 350 people. We'd love for you to come and join us. 
Uh, we're starting this ministry basically from scratch again, so we'd love you to be part of it. Any kind of gift that you have that you can bring into our ministry, hey, talk, let's talk and let's see what you can do and then we can do to help. What kind of power can uh, we all put together to really shoot out the ministry and the Word of God to the people in this community? We need a worship team. Come and join us. Okay? We need events teams, programs, Sunday school, anything. Come on, join us. If you have something on your heart that you think you really want to do and share with other people and just, and just help and volunteer, we'd love to have you here with us at Central Community Church. Also, if you can't make it to church at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning, hey, you can watch us at Hanford CCC videos on YouTube, which I'll put that up as well. Uh, 10 a.m. every Sunday morning. I said, but it's on there for all week long. But come and join us at 10 a.m. in the morning. Get the real experience, the live experience. Join us for that. We'd like to do the Facebook, but it's not really allowing us to do a lot of the music. So sometimes I'm trying to get this discernment alone on there. That doesn't always work. Facebook's very clunky when it comes to that stuff. But I always put the link on from YouTube onto our Facebook page. So if you click that, it takes you right away to YouTube. And from there, if you hit the little square up in the corner, hit that, it'll smart cast right onto your television if you have a smart TV. You can watch it right on your TV in full view. It's high def and you'll, you'll love it. It's absolutely beautiful. Each, each service is around an hour to hour and five minutes long. That's where we try to keep it at. So please come and join us for that too. It's 10 a.m. every Sunday morning on Hanford CCC videos on YouTube. We'd love to have you join us for that. Or just come to church and join us at 10 a.m. every Sunday morning. We have a turkey giveaway, which we're on in November, as we do each year. But we're trying to gather up stuff, monetary donations to buy turkeys and all the uh, goods as well. But also, if you want to come in and drop off some canned, canned vegetables, some uh, box stuffing, some box mashed potatoes, packages of gravy mix, cranberries, and whatever else goes with a turkey dinner, just contact the church at centralcommunity1950 at gmail.com. Leave a message when you'd like to drop that off. Leave a message with our church, uh, our church message center at 559-582-4762. Or you can call my number, 559 559- uh, 212-9679, call those numbers and drop off your, uh, just leave a message when you'd like to drop off, or better yet, come to church Sunday morning at 10 a.m. to talk to us, well, and, or bring stuff in then if you'd like. We'd love, to, or if you want to volunteer to help us on Thanksgiving, that's great too. We want to, we hope, we, do, we did 35 turkeys and dinners last year, we hope to do even more this year, and we'd like you to be part of that as well. So please, let's start doing that now, see how many we can get together, do, let's do 100 if we can. Okay, let's do a hundred if we can. So please, if you can give, please do. We can be certainly appreciate it. And I know somebody at Thanksgiving time will really appreciate it. Okay, um, guys, we're gonna close in prayer. And uh, um, before we do it, we wanna pray for people that are, I would like you to keep my wife in your prayers. She's going through some health concerns. Just keep her in your prayers. You know, she, it's a worrisome time for her and for me too. So just keep her in your prayers. I won't go into any more detail than that, but just pray for her. Uh, pray for um, pray for Pat and Pam and, and Doris and Erlene and uh, uh, Brother Randy, Corey and Cindy up in Canada. Pray for all those that are traveling this summertime as the kids are out of school, that they have just a wonderful, safe summer, wherever they're traveling. Okay, Pray for those that have been staying away from the church for the last week, basically since COVID as well. But pray for them that they find some encouragement in their heart. They find a church wherever it is. If it's not here, that's fine. They find a church somewhere where they can be in fellowship with other Christians. Pour some encouragement upon them. Give them some strength to say that you're not alone in this. And they're with you. They're with you together. Sometimes that's what we need to know that we're not alone. So we're going to pour encouragement on people's hearts like that. We're also going to pray for those that are going through a depressing or hurtful time in their lives right now. So as we pray in intercessory prayer, remember you pray with us. Whatever your request is, whatever your praise is, pray, as, the, as the words are being said, you pray as well. Whatever it is that's on your heart, pray with us. Let's join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, many people are struggling today. Many people. You say in your word that we should be anxious for nothing, but prayer by, but prayer and supplication. We should present our request to you. And Lord, that's what we're doing this morning, privately and publicly. Our hearts are filled with anxiety, and this is affecting our health. So Lord, please calm us now. Grant us inner peace and shield us from suffering. Remove fear and anxious thoughts from our minds. And Lord, just give us strength in our inner being. Lord, please forgive us when we've gone wrong and shut evil doors that we've opened for that devil. And may we find peace and comfort in you alone. Holy God, we honor and exalt your name. We bring our loved ones who are in pain because of new and past experiences in your hand. 
And Lord Jesus, you came to set the captives free, set your children free from these hurts and, and help them just to, Lord, just help them all that are hurting just to move forward and let deliverance be upon their lives and cause them to possess the possession. Lord, let your glory fill their lives and let every chain of bondage, of pain and bitterness just be broken in the name of Jesus. Cover your children with your wings of healing and turn their mourning into dancing. Lord, we ask you to grant our friends and family and those listening today, and those strangers that are struggling with health, take away sickness from them and put none of those evil diseases that we know among them. May we prosper, may they all prosper and be in health even as our souls prosper. Lord, these are requests and concerns for our family, our friends, and those the world over that have been plagued with disease, poverty, stress, physical and mental anguish, anguish after disease lately. Please give them, give them their health back, Lord, and heal their wounds. Cause them to walk in divine health for the rest of their lives. Father, life gets busy, and at times we lose track of the most important thing, and that is worshiping you. Forgive us for putting our schedules before you. Give us the grace to continue fellowshipping with other Christians for the glory of your name. Lord, this morning we thank you for ministering to our hearts. Let worship be a lifestyle to everyone that is gathered here online and here at the church. And not just something we do when we come to this place or gather together on Sunday. Glorious Father, you created us to worship you. And that's why we've gathered here to spend time together in your presence. And as we prepare to go to our various destinations in the week ahead, Father, we ask you to be with us. Be our hiding place and shield us from every plan of the enemy till we meet again. And this is our prayer this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, I want to thank you so much for joining this week. It's been such a pleasure to present these messages to you. I hope you're getting something out of them as I do preparing them. You know, we all struggle with things in our lives, and I go through those same things too. I, I, I've had a tough week. But in it all, this message meant a lot to me. That through these pains and struggles, there's a joy, joy in Christ. There's a joy, triumphant joy in Christ. Take that to heart, because there are going to be terrible, tough times. And there's no stronger time for the presence of Christ to be in your life during, as, as in during those difficult times. So take that to heart. Take that to heart. I want you guys to know I care about you, we care about you, and we love you so much. And we look forward to the day when we see you here worshiping God with us together and just extend the love to each other that we know we feel here, but so much better in person. So God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. Let you know that I, all lo I love you all. Take care, and I hope to see you all very, very soon. God bless you. Have a wonderful week, and I'll see you next Sunday. Bye, guys.